I'd like to call um, this meeting to order at 1.01 p.m. Would you um, call the roll, please? Yes. Okay. Board Member Corsi? Here. Board Member Gonzalez? Here. Here. Board Member Raven? Here. Board Member Rogers? Vice Chair Here. Here. Thank you very much. Um, let the record reflect that all members are present, with the exception of Member Rogers. Item two, approval of the minutes. Does anybody have any changes to the minutes? Uh, do we have any public comment on item 2.1, approval of minutes? Okay, seeing none, we'll approve the minutes of June 20, 2024 as submitted. We need a motion for that. Okay. Item three, public comments on non-agenda matters. We are not now taking public comments on item five, item three, excuse me, non-agenda matters. This is a time when any person may address the board on matters not listed on the agenda, but which are within the scope of this committee. Do we have any um, anybody who would like to make public comment? Uh, all right, with that, public comment is closed. Item four, um, I'd like to call item 4.1, which is a Report policy discussion, key elements of the downtown infrastructure financing plan, also known as IFP, presented by Gabe Osborne, Director of the Planning and Economic Development Department. Thank you, Chair Fleming. Um, bear with me for presentation. Okay. Well, thank you, Chair and members of the board. Um, our agenda for today, I know we haven't met in a while. Uh, we've, we've skipped a few meetings, um, but our, so our agenda today is to really provide a recap of what we've been working on in that time frame. Um, we are getting closer to presenting the IFP, and we're making headway in that direction. So we'll recap some of our revenue projections. We'll recap some of the core principles that the IFP is framed around, just so the board has an understanding as that document's presented. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about those foundational elements. It'll all be about revenue. Um, where we have really left off is obviously the tax increment commitment is a critical piece to this. Uh, the county has provided in, um, input on that tax increment as of August 20th, and the city is currently going through that process to do the same. Um, so once that uh, materializes, we'll have that baked into the IFP, and then that will move forward for, through the more formal adoption process. Uh, so just a few pieces I wanted to start off with here. Uh, Sonoma County did develop an EIFD policy earlier in this year. We did reference that policy a few times in the PFA meeting. Um, we'll talk about some specifics, and I want to give specific clarity around uh, whether or not the city and the county tax percentages need to match per the policy. Um, and I apologize on our end, there may have been some confusion around that. So we'll provide clarity on that today, because that's really one of the important pieces of the EIFD policy for the county. So um, basically, this, these bullet points come straight out of the county's policy. Um, the first is the city's contribution of property tax increment as a percentage um, must be equal to or greater than the county's tax increment percentage. Um, there was a lot of back and forth conversation as to whether it's percentage or dollars invested, because those are, those are two different pieces. Uh, many of the conversations as we started engaging with our consultant team, and I know the county has acquired services through Cosmot to do the same, um, much of the best practice or industry standard, for lack of a better term, is about dollars. It typically is the city puts more dollars in than the county. Um, so really what we have here is more policy direction that is on the percentage and a best practice that's, that's about dollars. But purely from a policy standpoint, it is about the percentages matching. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about what that means when we get into revenue projections in the next few slides. 
Uh, so some of the other points is the county cannot contribute 100% of its property tax. Uh, that was the main piece of the policy. Um, and then one of the core documents that we deal with as part of um, the IFP is what's referred to as a fiscal impact analysis. And we'll talk a little bit today about what that is and where we currently stand with the draft form of that. Um, but an important piece from the county is the fiscal impact analysis must be conducted. Um, and it also needs to show, um, excuse me, I have a window that is popping up on my end and I apologize for that. So the IFP must show a positive net impact to the county's general fund. Uh, so that's a critical piece of that document. Um, so as we go through the draft, we will review that draft and prepare that draft based on this criteria. So in addition to supporting economic development, uh, the county was also specific about the types of projects that could be supported. And it really aligned with board strategic priorities um, in certain following areas. So what's identified in the policy is affordable housing, climate adaption and resiliency, transient oriented development, active transportation, or projects that are advancing racial and social equity. Uh, so that's another framework that we're working in as we work up our project list. Um, and the last bullet point is really just essentially stating that EIFDs must be consistent with state code, which is the direction that we're taking as we move forward. So when we look at tax percentages, and I, I think this is an important point as we start getting into the actual percentage of the increment. So on the 20th, the county, the Board of Supervisors committed to 25% of their tax increment. Um, now, when we look at property taxes, it can be a little confusing when we look at the percentages. So when the, we look at the revenue collected, and this is the revenue collected of the 1% assessed value, which is the standard property tax, out of that overall increment, the county is 19.83 of that amount, and the city is 11.98% of that amount. Um, and of course, the 100% and the rest of that goes to schools and other functions. So, so that's the percentage that comes to the city and the county. So when we presented some of these initial documents about the city's share, it is also included VLF or vehicle license fees. So vehicle license fees are what we pay as individuals that drive vehicles um, through our registration process. And that amount really kicks down to the cities. And it's, it's changed over time on how that's calculated. Um, and I am not an expert on this. We have our financial folks here to, to assist me where I might need some help. Um, but generally in 2004, some changes were made on how the VLF is calculated. And it is actually calculated where it is based on assessed value. Um, so it kicks in as the assessed value increases, the VLF increases and kicks down to the local jurisdiction. So what that results in is it actually becomes another percentage of the tax. So when we look at VLF, it's actually 5.43 of the increment that's secured. So as that increment goes up, that VLF total amount is going up by that 5.43 amount. Um, and then in some of the initial drafts that we produced to sort of recognize this industry standard that the dollar amounts matter and there's an equal match is our consultant had added the VLF share into the amount. So in looking at those two percentages, um, really what happens is the city and the county actually get quite a bit closer on the total contribution. Um, because when we look at uh, the city's 11.98 plus the 5.43 percentage, that results in almost 17, actually 17.41% 17 of the increment where the county is 19%. So the city, city is still slightly lower, um, but it gets a little closer to that amount. Um, so what that means is as we look at tax percentages of increment, we have to just recognize the total dollars are an important industry standard piece. Um, but then also when we're matching percentage wise, um, it isn't going to necessarily generate the total dollar amount. If we exclude VLF, it will drop off. If we include VLF, it will be much closer. Um, so generally, I think we have the way the math works out when you look at the total dollar amount through the 1% that goes to the city and the county, just that bucket of money then you're typically probably at about 55% to the county and 45% to the city just on the 1%. And then the VLF shifts that a little bit. Um, so I think that's a really important point. I know we've presented some of these numbers, but we've never really broken it out at its own slide. Um, so this is really what those percentages look like. So we can understand the shares and how it's divvying up based on percentage. And then obviously when we look at revenue and the amount of money coming in, it'll be based on these percentages. And then we can see those dollar amounts and how they distribute between these three categories, VLF, city, and county. Um, and I'm happy to pause, Chair, if there's any questions about it. Good point to pause because it's so technical. 
Does anybody have any questions about this piece of it? Go for it. I do. So if the opening statement is that typically cities do contribute more in terms of real dollars than even looking at this, it would seem that I would prefer a flip that there be 19 from the city and 17 from the county just to be play it safe. But are you saying we should wait until later when we actually break it apart? Well, so this is basically what the city and the county receive for property tax. Ah, not what they're going to contribute. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So I'm gonna, will, I have will, questions on the on that on the pot side later. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Okay. This is really just a primer to get into the discussion of how when we talk about increment and that pot of money, what generates that pot. And then when we talk about sharing to the EIFD, then we're slicing up that pot. So I think what you're saying, this is my understanding of it, is that if the city and county were both to give all of their increment to this. The city would come in a hair to about two percentage points lower than the county in terms of the amount given in raw dollars. That's correct. If the city throws their VLF plus the one percent right. into the wash. But that when the county set forth the ordinance that they will give 25 percent and that it has to be and that cannot be um, less than the city gives. If the city gives 25 percent and the county gives 25 percent, that meets the county standard. That meets the county standard, but the city would be contributing roughly apples and oranges that are related. Yes. So got it. But so if it was 25 and 25, city would be contributing less. Less dollars, but same percentage. Right. Right. Got it. Everyone clear? I have a question. Oh, so uh, through the chair, I think it'd be worth just clarifying this because yeah, I agree. This is technical and let's let's kind of get to it. Cause I, you were, I think, almost spot on the way I would describe it. Mm -hmm. But I'll tweak it a little bit. The city to meet the county's standard is going to need to be above the percentage of the county mm -hmm. to make it equal out on dollars basis. Understood. So, okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure that their uh, their standard sets forth that the percentage has to be met by the city, but even if we met them at equal, they would exceed us in raw dollars. Correct, and then therefore we would not meet the county's standard. So their standard then is not about the percentage or standard is that we need or exceed their raw dollar total. Yep. That's, what we're, that's what we're trying to okay. clarify right now Thank is you. to say that the city, that the county has set forth a percentage standard from their perspective, but from our perspective, our percentage needs to fall into dollar amount to match the county. So it is not an apples to apples comparison. We need to do the math on the county side to then come up with what our matching percentage is, which will be higher. And that's so the, just to, to spitball it, mm -hmm. the county's at 25%. We would probably need to be around 28, 29% to match it. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yes. Just, just two questions. From what you've described, Scott, I didn't see that language in the policy adoption. It just talks about percentage. So, but that's the understanding between the parties. Is that I, I'll I'll, de I'll defer to Gabe a little bit, just but for I think to add some color to this conversation. A lot of discussion has happened amongst staff on exactly how are we inter interpreting this standard. And, and yeah, Gabe's done a great job of really narrowing that down and give us that guidance. Yeah. And uh, Chair, I've moved back a few slides here. So this language is directly out of the county's policy. Um, mm -hmm. So the contribution of property tax increment as a percentage must be greater than or equal to the property tax increment contribution of the county. So really what that means. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, understand. Understand. Yep. yeah, understand. Yeah. Um, but then I think to Scott's point, um, where it becomes challenging is that if both come in at 25%, it's consistent with the policy that the county is then contributing more dollars to the pot. And the recommendation and some of the discussion in front of the Board of Supervisors from you know, the recommendation from Cosma was that really goes against what they normally see through EIFDs. Uh, typically from a best practice standpoint or this historic practice that the local, the city usually does contribute more than the county. So I think the challenge, and this is where this point gets a bit confusing, is we have policy constraints and best practice. And I think the way we will work it is we will look at both as part of the analysis, um, but as we move forward with this discussion in front of our full council, um, there will be options there so we understand what is both, right? The, from a policy standpoint, we will honor and recognize what the county has put forward. Um, from a best practice standpoint, um, we'll have to review that as part of the equation, but we'll make sure we daylight that in front of the full council so they understand the difference between the mm -hmm. two. 
Um, and I, I appreciate the conversation. This is why we wanted to spend some time with this slide because um, it, you know, depending on how it's discussed, um, especially within the community, it seems to be a lack of understanding as to whether it's a percentage match or a dollar match. And really technically it can be both in a lot of ways, you know, when we look at it from a best practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other question I have, um, am I not correct that the property tax increment non-VLF is constitutionally mandated mm -hmm. and the VLF adjustment is statutory mandated? I believe that's, yeah, I yeah. that's right. I believe Which that's means the legislature, if it feels it needs to gobble up that tax increment, could do so. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, they have to scour some codes yeah. to, to put the exclamation point at the end of it. But I believe that's right. Just a quick observation. I'm oh, sorry, Karen. Yeah. We've seen the manipulations of the state over mm -hmm. 30 years almost, and mm -hmm. actually all the way back to 1979 of mm -hmm. how they monkey around with things whenever they, they think they need to. I'm not saying they do that. I'm just saying we might want to be aware of that. Yeah, the, the, all of this came about from, uh, there was a constitutional provision back in 04. And, and that's, that's where, what this is coming out of. So what I need to check is exactly if, if the swap part, if the VLF swap part was part of that constitutional part of it or, or not. And, and, I, and, and that's just where I'm, where I'm hedging because they, kind of, they kind of flow together, but there was only one particular part in the constitution. I don't remember exactly what that was. So sure. we, can, we can follow back up, but I believe you're right. And just, I'm going to the same place. <laughs> um, there have been changes even since 2004, and I believe in 2023, there was a change from 1% to 0.65% that um, came of what the percentage of VLF that would come to cities. So that's just something to, to validate, you know, yeah. what's changed and then um, how we sort of address that uncertainty with the legislative capability to make percentage adjustments, you know, in what flows down to cities and counties over the period of the bonds, right? And so that sort of it's an open question of how do you how do you mitigate that potential variability? And okay. I think that that's an incredibly important piece that needs to be identified in the infrastructure financing plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so once, once we get through this pot of money that's developed through the collection of the taxes, um, we start to better understand, and, and this is really what DTA has worked on, really what the distribution to the district looks like if you start to settle at 75, 50, and 25%. Um, so we really start with those revenue assumptions on just general basic categories of 50, we use 50% as a placeholder. Um, much of the documents that we presented showed the city and the county at 50% at the placeholder. Um, we do have guidance from the county that is now 25% of that increment. Um, so we have rerun some rough revenue calculations to determine what that would look like over the life of the IFD. And a few of these slides will discuss that. Um, I think it's really important to note that the 50% on the city side still is a placeholder. Now, when we go through the, the fiscal impact analysis and better understand the impact to the district of diverting those funds, obviously, as we move this forward to the council, there will be a staff recommendation and then giving the council the appropriate information to make a determination on what's best for the city with the, the contribution to that district. Um, so that still is a bit of a moving target at this point, um, but we've been working on a lot of the data behind the scenes, building a model, so it's easy enough to start plugging in numbers as those numbers change. So basically what we have presented before, and once again, just trying to break these in into a few slides that talk about these main points, because this model will carry forward into the IFP, is we always deal with growth assumptions within the district. And that's always very difficult for the consultant to figure out if you're tracking all the way to 2070. Um, so generally what a DTA has done, and I think uh, Cosmot has provided some feedback that in some situations these can be conservative or a little aggressive. 
Um, but this is an area, especially with our downtown, where we have done a lot on the city side to promote growth. And we have seen some of that growth. So this could be viewed as conservative with these growth, set, growth estimates, um, but time will tell. It, it's very difficult to make that determination formally within a document we produced today, like I said, that goes out to 2070. Um, so this is really one of the big pieces that our finance team and our planning and economic development team will be working on when looking at that FIA. It's really what is the return on the investment? And it's many of the same points that the county has made. You know, what does this really look like 20 years from now and or is the EIFD investing projects that actually trigger a positive net gain, build up that assessed value. Um, I think one of the important pieces with the city is obviously if we talk about dollars for dollars is going into the district, um, obviously the county is really an assessed value and a property tax, um, but there are certain project types that can trigger additional sales tax, that can trigger TOT, where that may be more of a benefit to the city. Um, so, and a lot of times that is why the cities contribute a bit more to that district because there's potentially other benefits, but that all needs to be flushed out as part of the document. So bringing back to the slide, our growth assumptions that DTA has put in are 4% increases in assessed value for residential land uses. So that's any parcel in the district that's zoned as residential and 3% increases in commercial. And that is flat. So that is just carried through for the life of the district. And then as they build that out, then that produces a model that generally shows based on those, those projections, how much money the district is going to build year to year to year when bonds are available, and then ultimately a total cost that the district will anticipate producing at the end of its lifespan. So really, and this gives an idea as we go through the percentages, how this potentially will work and what it looks like as far as activating this district um, and potentially implementing projects in the near future. So, and I know this is fairly small and I apologize for that. Um, we do have it attached. I don't, I don't want us to get off track, but those are zoned, but much of the district is actually either commercial or residential from mm -hmm. the zoning standpoint. Yep. So how is that determination made? It, it's difficult um, because even when it is zoned, there's rezoning processes that typically a property through a development situation can shift. So as we work out the IFP, one of the biggest challenges I think with this process is understanding that the universe you have now is not static mm -hmm. and it will change. So when development comes in, obviously that's driving increment and that's bringing these big jumps potentially. And if you take a building such as 420 Mendocino and you redevelop that to 200 apartment units, then the assessed value jumps way up. Um, so really, the unfortunately, I think what they have to do at this point is go with a fairly static model. Um, when it gets into growth projections, it gets a little different because then it's looking at more of the assessed value, um, but it is not affecting the baseline. So usually from a fiscal impact analysis, if they kept this baseline going, because there could be years where you don't produce the 4% increase on the residential, um, then it has to factor out the peaks and valleys over the 70 years. And it's actually, the, I think, one of the challenging roles on our, our finance team side to really understand what that looks like. Um, and when we get into a return on investment sort of um, conversation, it, it a lot of times leads towards for a dollar invested, the city or the county is going to get a dollar or 50 back. Very difficult to figure out at this point in time. Um, so to answer your, your um, question, board member Fitrell, is that it doesn't change. That this model is set and it holds that moving forward from a projection standpoint as baked into the IFP. The projections will affect and ultimate development and change will affect um, how the revenue is brought in, but it's not affecting the reports that are generated as a very static report at this point in time looking out to 27. So just for clarity, it's not actually Zoning, because the zoning is both. It's the current use, whether it's commercial or residential. Yes, it's the current use. Okay. Yes, and it's really just assuming that stays for a period of time. And generally, you see more of that growth on the residential side than you do on the commercial, which is why it's the one percentage higher. Um, so this, uh, as I said before, I apologize for the small text. If you can't see it, it is attached to the document. Um, so generally what DTA does is start building out the model and projecting out the revenue. Um, so I will read off some of these numbers um, and you will see these as the IFP moves forward. Um, the starting point is once again, we'll see the percentages in there. Uh, the 19.83, the 11.98 for the 1% city and county. Uh, and then the 4.53 for the VLF are, are listed throughout this document. 
And the document identifies the total increment that's going to the district. So it always starts with that, that pot of money and revenue that is coming in, and then it breaks it up based on three categories. Um, and really it's the percentage-based pieces are important. So um, if you can see there, the, the lower row lists 25% that we know from the county, it still has the 50% placeholder for the city, um, but also because their administration costs for the EIFD long-term uh, is generally pulling 5% into the administration bucket. So it's identifying that and that's growing. And then obviously there's annual reporting and managing the PFA for the long-term. Um, so the EIFDs always cover a proportionate share to um, admin. So what we can see here is obviously in, in the first few years, you're really not bringing much revenue because it's based on that growth. So in 25, 26, um, the assumed pot of money from increment is $97,000. And then in that same year, based on 25, 50, and then the 5% moving on, it's assuming that $30,000 goes to the district. And then that money is going to grow year to year to year in this model based on those assumptions of the four and 3% growth. So if we pull that out and we jump a few years here because we start seeing more substantial numbers when we get into 20, 33, 34, um, is you start seeing growth there. And if the money is spent as it goes, then obviously you have a drawdown on it. But if there are commitments to keep the money in there for a period of time to allow for the bonding to come into the mix, um, that is something that the jurisdictions can decide on as well as the PFA. And we'll talk about that a little bit in, in these future slides. Um, but ultimately, what we run out based on those calculations in 2069, 2070, uh, we're pulling in roughly $3 million a year. And then the overall revenue collection is around $52 million based on that. And that, once again, is based on those flat rates just running it out through the course of time. So typically in the formation of EIFDs, when we look at projects, although that number may very well be much higher, much lower than the 52 million because of the unknown nature of growth, is that usually is sort of that baseline project number. And then as we look at putting dollar amounts to projects, there's a few different ways that it can be done. It could be either splitting up that amount or assigning percentages to the different projects. Um, and we'll talk about this in, in these future slides um, but I think this is just an important thing that we wanted to show to, to get the PFA comfortable with the concept of tracking how the model works. So as those percentages shift, DTA is simply just changing numbers in that model, and that model is, is, is changing the assumptions on the year-to-year -year revenue. Um, so happy to pause here as well, Chair, if there's any questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Because I'm slow at this thing, so I have, I have lots of questions. So... In the initial uh, years of accrual, I see it's about 97,000 every year, right? Do, 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 do. Okay, then we go out to fast forward to 2033. If I heard you correctly, so when I was reading down below, I went, okay, I'm not getting something here. By the time we reach 2070, you're saying we are <laughs> accruing 3 million a year? Okay. All right, that, that now sets my heart at ease because when I was looking at the products, I go, we can't afford anything that's on this list. What are we doing? Which leads me to my next question, though, depending on how ambitious we get. Um, does this disallow getting other funds to supplement, let's say, a state grant or a federal grant or whatever? Okay. And if that gets added to this EFID pot, that can also make, make it grow if it's allowed to grow a little bit more. Like you say, we want to grow it enough so that we can get the benefit of, you know. Um, if, if that happens, then those projections will also change later, right? Well, one way to look at that is that the projections would not change in this document. Um, year to year to year, the revenue is going to fluctuate based on the assessed value. And if that goes up much higher than the 5%, more money will be brought in. If it's lower, less money will be brought in. Um, when we look at this, and I'll talk a little more in depth about this when we go into the project list, but if we look at this, and I think it's an important point to note, is that tax increment financing usually isn't the sole funding source for a project. So it's creating a pot of money. And if a project comes in, it is looking at other pot of monies to construct. So in a situation such as a, a public-private partnership where you're doing some joint investment and you're working together with a private entity, you're providing a benefit to the private entity, you're getting a public benefit out of that, a lot of different funding sources that come into that. Private money, it could be other public dollars, it could be grants. Um, so overall, when 
the expenditure list for that project is being laid out, the EIFD is a line item in there. And I think that's the easier way to think about it. Um, so for, especially for the larger projects. Now, when EIFDs are doing smaller projects, and I think beautification, um, activation of the right of way, um, where you're really accumulating a pot of money in there and then spending it, you really could do the same thing. It could pair with a grant. So you're dealing with matches, you're basically building up to where you're dealing with the 50% share that you need to get from the EIFD. Um, there's a variety of different ways to look at that. But I think the simplest way is that other revenue sources don't affect this because okay. this is really just a line item. Thank you. Chair, if, if I may, to the chair, um, or member Gonzalez, I, I wanna clarify just one point you made just because I am the be a stickler on, on the numbers at the moment because we're showing some. The number you cited earlier, the 90,000 gate, would you mind going back to the prior slide? Where it starts off at 97,000, that is the total amount of increment, total. We're only talking about taking a portion of that increment from the county and a portion of that increment from the city, which brings us down to the I number below, which is the no, 30,000. That I understood. That okay, understood. Okay, great. But I was wondering then, even with the smaller amount that accrues over time, if at the end of it, you know, we're a little short or we need a little bit more, can we bring in external grants or, you know, if it's Understood. allowed or it's like, no, it's taboo. You can't mix funds. Understood. Yeah. And, okay. and one of the tools of EIFDs is matching funding for grants. Okay. So it, it, it plays a pretty significant role in that. Thanks. Thank you. Hey, uh, my question really goes to, and probably more hypothetical, but I would imagine that the bonding mm -hmm. capacity is really predicated obviously upon the uh, 4%, 3%. So I'm just trying to understand what influence does a bonding does the bond maker have to do with the, they have to accept those as reasonable, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how liberal or how conservative either we would be or they would be or whether or not we have to reconcile as you go forward. Same thing with the project list. So I'm just curious about that. Thank you for your question. It's an important one. So as you can imagine, us finance folks and especially the bond folks are far more than conservative. They're going to follow the law. Yeah. And so the law is going to dictate that the, that the, separate entity here that the, the, the that they're going to build revenue to then base how much we can bond out on how much revenue is coming in. Mm -hmm. None of the bonding is going to be based off of hypotheticals. Mm -hmm. It is going to be based off of how much revenue is coming into the EIFD, and therefore they base a percentage of how much bonded indebtedness we can go into mm -hmm. based off of how much money is going in. That's why essentially the function of an EFD is a slower function to bond because we need to build the revenue to a point where we can actually raise significant principal towards projects. And when the IFP and the, it comes back, it shows that as a schedule on at this point, you've built enough revenue to be able to bond out X amount. Like what Gabe has been explaining at this point, the numbers being put forth are all hypothetical when the bonding happens, it's not based on hypothetical. It's based on how much actual revenue is coming in, okay. which long, could mean more or less principal. How long does that take to establish that track record before we can bond against it? Right. So it's 125% of what we can totally bring in. And how long does that take? I'm going to kind of skirt that exact question because I really want to see the documents back from DTA on that to give their schedule on when we'll start to be able to issue. I believe the very first indebtedness, and this is from my memory at this point, happens if I fumble around here for a few minutes, I can come up with it. But it's well, three or four, three, you four can five stall years. And I can fumble. Yeah, he, <laughs> my boss will, I can delegate to them. He can fumble through it, but it's four or five years. And at that point, you're issuing a fairly small, relatively, as I would describe it. Correct. So in year 2033, we're talking about going out for our first bond. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think your critical point, which I don't want to miss right now, when you look at the numbers of totals in bonded indebtedness that can be raised by the EIFD, it is over time. So that first issue is going to be very small. It's a, it's a gradual bonded indebtedness. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and then obviously the other core piece to an EIFD is the project list. Um, and the slide you see here uh, is the same slide that we presented to the Board of Supervisors um, on the 20th. 
Uh, it recognizes a lot of the back and forth conversations that have been had even with board supervisors at PFAs regarding project lists. Um, so what you see here are the categories we discussed. Uh, there were some general amounts that we put in as what we thought a project of that nature would cost. Um, but once again, as we program this project list for the IFP, those amounts start to be based on the total revenue that we think the EIFD will, will accumulate over time. That is one option. The other option is it can be based on percentages. Um, and as we know, affordable housing being development component was 20%, we can base those percentages into those projects. Um, and as the, the city council gets a look at the project list with the discussions about the tax increment, um, that may play out with those specifics. Um, when we brought this to the board, um, there was general support of the list. Uh, what we got back was a lot of the criteria for project selection, such as we can't surplant, um, that ROI is important, um, there was a discussion about the connectivity projects, and I think most, most people in the county really recognize the need to connect Sproward Square in, in downtown area. Um, so that was some of the feedback that we received. So our next task is to really take this list and form it into something that will populate the IFP. And now there's a few different ways that we can do that. Um, what the consultants are recommending, especially since this is in a situation where we have a public-private partnership at the table with a development proposal, where we are intending to fund a specific item and the PFA knows exactly what that is. Uh, this is really putting a tool in the economic development toolbox to support growth, to support those projects as they come to the table, to figure out a way to make that environment better downtown that just encourages activity. So when that's the case, which does happen in the IFDs, the consultants typically push towards very broad categories, very broad categories. And then part of that is then populating criteria into the IFP for how those project lists are selected. Um, and the best example I can give is if it's economic development, that the projects have to support both local and regional economic development goals as specified by strategic plans developed through the county and the city. Um, that's one way to um, another can be that it has to produce an ROI or it has sort of a job creation threshold to it. Um, because I think when we get into conference center performing arts, some of those bigger projects that we want to see downtown, um, everyone has their own personal opinion about what they want to see in Santa Rosa. But if we break it down to what's best from an economic development standpoint, that's a mathematical equation that we would need to know up front. And it's very difficult to do that at this point unless we're pulling in industry standards and, and items of that nature. When that project's at the table, there's more work that can be done to determine what that economic need is for that project. So that is one way to handle it. It can be a very broad category and it could be something like entertainment facilities, that broad, and then criteria on how the PFA makes that selection. And with that criteria, it can be a few different ways. It can be that it's done in coordination with the county and the city. So the county and the board of supervisors and the city council bless the project or the board of supervisors and the city council can set the criteria for selecting the project where that's then baked into the IFP, the PFA has to maneuver through that when making the determination. Um, so those are some of the tools in the toolbox for taking these projects into broad categories, but then also determining how you navigate through those broad categories over the life of the EIFD. Um, so what we did talk, you know, one of the projects that were mentioned is redevelopment of the fairgrounds. Um, that actually, because of the connectivity and the closeness to downtown can provide an economic benefit to downtown. That was a bit of an add-on. Um, some of the projects you see here were, were discussed as we started going through the initial project list. Um, we had a presentation about a conference center in the downtown area. Um, when looking at entertainment and performing arts, that seems to be a category of its own, and that can obviously be an economic driver in the downtown as well. Um, the categories, excuse me, the columns we have to the right are really just identifying where those projects could be built. Um, obviously, that when you build, when you pull the fairgrounds into the mix, the county owns land there, uh, the city owns land in the downtown, and then obviously you have private property. So it's really just identifying where you may actually be more of clearly a public-private partnership because of the location of it. Um, but I would imagine any of those larger projects, if they are performed on city or county-owned lands, ends up being a public-private partnership um, in a much bigger scale project to make something like that work. 
Um, so at this point, uh, we wanted to really daylight the fact that we are working with this list. Um, we're going to be moving this list forward. Happy to get input on that criteria and how we think the PFA up until 2070 would be comfortable managing through this. Um, but I think one of the challenges we are dealing with with this particular project is the fact that there isn't a defined project in the mix. So it's, it's pushing us into these broad categories um, and then just getting that clarity on how we maneuver through those broad categories is important. Um, and it doesn't necessarily fully have to happen today. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the timeline, uh, but this is a critical piece that we will be working on as well as getting the commitment from our full council on the tax percentage. But that conversation, and I really think it, it happened to the Board of Supervisors as well, it gets to be that the, the tax increment is it's really important to know the projects as well. What are we investing in when we give up that increment? Because there is a fiscal impact to taking that increment out of the bigger general fund and putting it in the district. So the project list is a pretty important one. So with that, happy to pause if there's any questions, any guidance, um, any additional information that the PFA would like to provide on the project list. So before we go to um, questions from the um, PFA, I'd like to know if you walked away today with one or two things, having understood it from this board, what would that be specifically? So I, I think, and I'll add a piece here too, because I think it's really important to understand how the expenditures will work. Um, in this list, we have a variety of different categories that would likely be smaller projects. And the EIFD can build up the money and you can spend the money on smaller projects and you can move forward in that direction. Um, I think the challenge you run into is that when you're moving forward in that direction, you're never accumulating enough to cover the debt service on the bonds. So it makes it very difficult to then chase the larger projects when they come to the table. So what would be helpful is to really understand from a priority standpoint from the PFA, is the priority the larger development project in these areas identified? And from a secondary standpoint, if we need an expenditure path because we don't have that larger project that comes in, can we move to the other categories? Um, because I think that's really helpful from a priority standpoint. And then I think when we get into those larger projects, there's still the opportunity to do some industry standard ROI analysis as we move it forward to city council to have that discussion. Um, but I think that's really an important piece because it does affect how the money is used as it accumulates into the district. And one more clarifying question. It's, is it the responsibility of this board to recommend projects um, to our respective boards and those boards to bless, bless those projects, as you said? Um, and they and they don't tell us what to do. We, we give them our suggestions and they just determine whether or not that works. I think that's an incredibly positive way to look at it. I, I think the challenge with this process is that you have the Board of Supervisors, you have the City Council and you have the PFA and all have to approve the IFP in some way, shape or form. Um, and I think the important piece is to generally get consensus and buy-in that if the PFA can make a strong recommendation to the council, so we know where the PFA stands through that approval process, the council knows where the PFA stands, I think it creates an alignment in the list. And the county has provided some guidance. We factored that into the conversation uh, because each one of those entities has the ability to basically set us back to the starting point by not approving the IFP. Understood. The reason why I ask these questions is because you mentioned that the city and the county determine a lens and or a set of projects. And so trying to understand which way the flow is, if there's a valve, uh, which way that goes here. So with that, I'll turn it over to you guys. Okay. I'm always looking for more bang for our buck. And this is something that I heard uh, Supervisor Rabbit say at the, the August 20th meeting, that which of these projects would involve underutilized or non-utilized property where we can really see a change in the calculus and will give us more ROI at the back end. I think that's something that I would be most interested in, whether it's a smaller project or a larger project. Uh, can you remind us, Gabe, the life of the PFA? Do we disappear after the IFP is no. created? <laughs> we, we live with this. Yes. Forever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that it's nice to go? <laughs> I'm not sure it's helpful, but that's what the rules. Are. Okay. All right, you. Um, just just to, to be clear, the IFP could be very specific or broad, 
Both jurisdictions have to approve. Um, am I not correct that as a general rule, after that's been approved, PFAs in most cases are responsible for fleshing that out and implementing the IFP, always knowing the elected bodies can intervene if they don't like the drift of the decision making. That is correct. Yes, okay. I think uh, although it is possible to include, um, I refer to it as coordination, but it would be a more formal action by the Board of Supervisors and the City Council somewhere in the life of that PFA as decisions are made about expenditures. That can happen in the IFP, but that is rare. Yeah. It is usually the PFA that has full authority over the management of those funds. So in that sense, then the PFA, depending on what's ultimately approved, actually has a, re a project level responsibility as well as the overall recommending responsibility in terms of the language of the IFP. Yes, correct. So just, just a, a couple of, of observations here. Correct me where I'm wrong. We talked about the list, although you can argue that reprogramming Comstock Mall and activation and beautification of right-of-ways are really kind of the same sort of general rubric. Um, the, com the, the amounts though, there's, no, there's been no real discussion of allocation of dollars here between these by the PFA. Right. So that's a thought of what it might be involved. But in fact, we have to get to that, that point at some point uh, as part of the IFP once, until you know the revenue, you don't know what you can afford and all that, right? Got it, just wanted to be clear about that. Um, I just wanted also to mention that, you know, the issue of big bang projects versus smaller projects, a streetscape infrastructure redevelopment on the major central core corridors, which is something like over 6,500 lineal feet. That's not a small project. That's, that's a big project, um, potentially. Um, there are components that would be smaller, but the total bang could easily use up at $45 million there. Um, I've expressed my concern in the past about big bang projects that sit and never happen. Like, like we all know, like Keynes said, in the long run, we're all dead. In the long run, our younger cousins are all dead too. And if you don't get a present value impact, there's, you know, there's, there's an issue there, particularly at times of economic stress when these investments matter. It'll take a long time to bring things forward. Um, but uh, there's no, literally no small project here. There's just big and bigger, I would, I would argue. Um, there's the issue of, of on economics, that analysis will be done. It's, you know, it's critical. Um, the affordable housing uh, piece does not generate more property tax increment. So it has a different social value that really matters. Mm -hmm. And we all agree on that. Um, similarly, to create a dynamic central core that is the seat of, of government and population in the county, that also has a larger public benefit. When you come to climate change, which I saw as one of your guys' objectives in your policy, how you economically validate what that impact is, you know, is notoriously difficult to, to do. Um, so I'm just saying we have to have some some uh, play in the joints in, in all these, these things going forward. I'm just going to express this one, just one uh, board member, some concern about, about holding dollars for very, very, very large projects like a conference center, which, which is highly speculative at this point, um, or, the, uh, or the fairgrounds, super, super speculative, as opposed to moving forward with things that uh, make the central core much more dynamic and potentially can generate a lot more tax increment income. You beat me to the punch on the welfare exemption uh, on the affordable housing. And um, I think we all support housing of all types and uh, wanting to have a good mixture, but certainly on the affordable side, but knowing how that mix, that floats into the entire uh, mix for me is important as well. And I take it, I, I wanted to ask a couple these are fixed contributions, correct? If, if we go down a path of a project, we will make a fixed contribution. I guess, and what I'm asking is, I'm thinking of all the affordable housing projects. It just, Chris, we had the, um, at SMART yesterday, one that's been languishing for years now, looking for that last piece of financing, wondering how that works within the 
PFA, if we're only one small percentage of the overall financing, how do we how do we score that uh, internally as really putting putting that tax increment to work as soon as possible? So I'm also wondering, and I'm wondering too. I keep wondering how the so I would imagine we're trying to go after the best best of the best on the bonding. How that also plays into if we're going to go and be a minor or a small stakeholder and many projects, is that seen as a positive or a negative? I'll, I'll take the first question, Scott. Go ahead. Go ahead um, so the, it is not fixed. And I think that, you know, one of the pieces with the project list, and I have seen this in existing IFPs, is you can do a TBD. So they put a project cost that's to be determined. That is not being recommended by the consultants. Um, the recommendation is at least get it close to where you think it's going to be. Um, but typically with these total dollar amounts, they're leading up to a grand total for the district and the district may pull in 25% more than that or may pull in less. Um, I have seen situations where there is more of a percentage where it is that of the money that comes in, 20% goes to affordable housing or 30% goes to the, the projects. And then I would say at that point, the percentages are a bit fixed. Um, but then the percentage is of an accumulation of funds, which adjusts based on that tax increment. Um, and I think there is really a recognition in the IFP that you're once again talking about 2070 and the climate can change. Um, so this really sets a base of the projects. And I think this is one of the reasons why there is an encouragement to be broad, because it gives a little more flexibility to move around. It gives a little more flexibility to move the money, to really track with the dynamics of the community, and really to understand the economic development needs. I'll add because I think it's a critical part of this discussion is that we don't have all the information still. And that that's really where the rubber hits the road on this specific issue. Until we have back from the consultant, what type of capital we're looking, the numbers we're looking to raise through this and over what periods, that is going to be the critical piece of information to inform you as a group towards how you are going to allocate towards, towards any potential percentage or dollar basis or to the point of, are we looking at smaller or larger projects here? To be fair, just that is going to be the starting point of that conversation. So how much money is there? These are absolutely related to the two. And once we have that, a more robust conversation can happen that's productive. Seems like the ability to leverage also plays a huge role, right? Mm -hmm. Some of these projects I could imagine could have uh, a broader array of uh, funding sources available to us through grants than others. Without where the others are going to be our own. And we'll, you know, without question. And then that still informs us though, of how much do we have available through the EIFD funding source? Is that a meaningful amount towards the other funding sources we have? How does it all play, right? How do those dials? Okay, thank you. So I'm going to take us backward a little bit. Um, so we talked about, um, bonding and this is sort of on the subject of you know funding and financing and how we figure out how much money is available um bonding is one approach right i mean if we looked at private financing public private partnership and private equity does that give us any faster availability of funding than we would otherwise have were we to wait for five years to sort of accumulate known actual revenues into the district and um, and then be able to bond from there. So I'm asking a question, would the private equity markets look at that forward revenue stream and the securitization of that forward revenue stream any differently than the bond world would under the rules of EFID? That's an excellent that's a, question. That's a, that's, a, that's a great question. It's a great question. And I mean, to, to your question, the way I, I read it is, we certainly as a group can look at any type of debt instrument that's the most effective and appropriate given what we're trying to accomplish. That's what we're doing at the city all the time. We don't, we don't just look at what's the one way that we raise capital. We, we are looking at all of them. That would certainly be true here without having the legal documents in front of me. I, I can't answer whether or not what's gonna be available or not. So, so for me, the answer to that question plays into the project list. Um, because if the, if we're really limited and all we can do is, you know, we're, we're thinking about, well, we're going to uh, go in a traditional financing approach with, with bonds, then 
that leans towards a different, in my mind, a different project list than if we can take advantage of private equity and we can you know, more rapidly utilize those funds and have a bigger pot initially that we can allocate. Then I'm just myself, um, I'm really interested in some of the larger projects and how in advance things that I see have a meet the county's criteria of, you know, positive impact to the general fund, you know, of course, also to the city um, and avoided costs. It's a little hard for me to understand, you know, not to disparage streetscaping in any way, but it's hard for me to understand how we meet the county's criteria on avoided costs and when we're looking at a beautification project. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of leaning a little more towards if the funds are there, <laughs> can we do some of the larger projects? Um, and absolutely funds have to be leveraged. And I think that should be one of our criteria, selection criteria um, is the potential for leverage. Thank you. So comment and a question. So for me, um, there's so much unknown in front of us mm -hmm. that I feel like we really need to have broad categories rather than specifics. I have a hard time even seeing how we get to specifics until we have a lot more information than we do now. But um, I don't have a problem with that. I, you know, I feel like this is a way for, for us to open a bank account, start putting money into it. And um, we don't know how we're gonna use that yet, but we're gonna be around. Someone is gonna be in these chairs uh, for the life of this thing. And the decisions that have to be made need to be made in the context of the amount of revenue that we already have, the amount of revenue that we expect to be coming in, the, the needs at the time, what the opportunities at the time are as far as, as grants or public private partnerships. All of that um, to me says, make this broad, uh, preserve the ability to be flexible, um, with the money and the time and the needs, I mean, as it comes. I made sure. Um, thank you, Supervisor. And if I can extend your bank analogy, um, I think the challenge for all of us is there seems to be some agreement on opening a savings account, right? But we, at some point before producing a, a public IFP, need to be specific about well, what are we saving toward, right? Is it college? Is it a home? Is it a car? Um, and at some point before December, we've got to get clear on, yes, the broad categories are fine, mm -hmm. um, but what exactly are we saving toward? Yeah. Ferrari. <laughs> I, I think um, if I may just for a moment here, like, that I, I'm hearing that everybody wants the largest return on investment, that mm -hmm. there is some, it's, it's pretty hazy. I don't think any of us is really clear on what the number one thing is going to be, whether it's going to be some pretty ambitious streetscape projects or going toward um, a performing arts center or something. Uh, on the fairgrounds, which of those things is going to get us the outcome that we all want, which is an increase in, in revenues for both for our general funds going forward and to have our downtown look the way we we know it we know it will, right? And so um, I, I think it's like these um, the direct investment versus the return on invest the return on investment, whether these small things are going to produce or whether we need to save up for the large thing and we need to hobble along in the interim. And I think that that kind of is where I hear us a little stuck. And what I would love to hear from staff and not to put you on the spot is, are there economists, are there um, people who in the municipal world who do this work, who have a recommendation on how to approach a situation like this where there's not really a clear one way answer. We all might have interests in going a certain way, mm -hmm. but it's not really clear to me that there's a specific right answer. We want to do. We want to get the. We want to. We want to get an A on the test here. <laughs> and I think, Chair, to answer your question, there are economists and there are consultants that can really look at an area to say, based on the demographics, based on the existing conditions, based on your circulation, based on everything you have in that place, that we think this is the best use for that site. 
And some of that analysis will flush itself out as part of the conference center conversation at Simon. Um, you know, much of the conversation that we've been involved in is housing. And housing has a pretty significant role in downtown, especially with the revitalizing the area and basically creating that activity and potentially bringing the commercial in and driving up that tax increment. Um, so, but what I always say too, is there's really an important piece. Uh, you know, I live down the street on Sonoma, but what convinces me to go spend money downtown, right? Mm -hmm. How do we just drive that economy and get money going there? And it's a variety of different things that do that. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the dynamics of human beings on how they spend their money, which is a very challenging thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to specifically answer your question, yes, there, there are firms out there, um, Cosmod is one of them, and they're involved in the discussion of the conference center. And we had a conversation with Cosmod as of yesterday as to what they really think is the best use for the Simon site. Um, and I, I think as we bring that forward and we can show, because of industry standards, what has happened in other communities when you get those types of uses from an economic benefit, um, that is something that we can do as part of this process. Um, we just have to be mindful of the timelines and how far we can take that, but that level of um, sort of research and recommendation, um, I think is needed to help guide this conversation because it, it gets to be that we know that the, the big project is important, but we just don't know how to define what it is and where it's going. Because I know we, we got to put some, you know, oil in the engine. We got to, we got to turn the spigot on, so to speak. And, um, and so saving up for the big project seems kind of like a big scary leap. Whereas like something like streetscape and connectivity seems like Right now, we could get some bang for our buck. Mm -hmm. You still have something? Um, slightly different than where you were going. So, but um, trying to figure out the ROI, ROI on placemaking is a really challenging thing. Um, that's where broad categories help. You know, where you, you can you kind of everyone understands that there will be a value to placemaking, whether that's streetscaping or whatever it is, um, the beautification. Um, and that's, you can, you can cap, put that into a bucket of, um, you know, wellness or, you know, sort of in, environmental enhancement, um, beautification, those sorts of things. So, so there's that. Um, what I was struggling with was when we were talking about, and this is, uh, it goes to something that he was saying about the amounts and determining the amounts. Um, I'm struggling with like where the numbers came from and how precise you have to be. Something that you said a little a while earlier made me think you were talking about bid pricing as opposed to conceptual cost estimates as opposed, opposed to budgets, you know. <laughs> dark dark formed budgets you know so so i i'm also wondering about the numbers and and how we create those numbers um in the in the actual document itself in the ifp yeah and, and so I, i'll take this gabe um you're absolutely right and and i just want to underscore uh, it is difficult to come up with models, projections, without making certain assumptions, mm -hmm. right? And I'll call out the obvious, we're all trying to read a cloudy crystal ball right now, mm -hmm. right? But certain assumptions have to be made mm -hmm. just so we can um, produce a model that we can have a conversation. Um, to the economist question, uh, only because I I'm, currently on a thread with a couple of economists, right, from Goldman School of Public Policy. And economists don't always agree, <laughs> right? Um, and so what I'm getting at is what we are as staff trying to do is give you all uh, as accurate information as we have with the model and the assumptions that we have, um, being transparent about what those gaps are and, um, hoping that their city council or the supervisors PFA can coalesce around. Uh, we know we're taking a risk here. Mm -hmm. Is it a calculated risk? And are we assuming in the long run, there will be a positive return on investment? Mm -hmm. 
And if I can add to what Dario mentioned, and, and maybe a good recommendation in this point, when you deal with broad project categories, instead of worrying about the specific dollar amount for a project that in $2070 will be way off, is we can just set percentages. We can determine that if placemaking is a category and if it's the desire to set a certain amount of that money to placemaking, that is one way that, that we can get out of the specific dollar amounts. Yeah. Remember those then. Um, I think you'd said like in a slide that's yet to come that the expectation is that the city council will come up with its own number by November, but if it blows that deadline, what is that, what sort of delay is imposed on the rest of this timetable? Yes, I, I do have a future slide that addresses the whole timeline that um, I can talk about this, that chair, if we're ready to move forward. Are we ready to move forward on this? I think we've been, we could maybe add a little meat to it. Yeah, I just wanted to make one other observation. Every one of these potential uses has interesting characteristics mm -hmm. that have to be examined really closely. Conference center, for example, on the Sears site, uh, is not going to be generating any direct additional tax increment that's going to be a nonprofit organization. It'll produce a little bit of in lieu tax for depending, uh, but it may have a radiating effect on uh, hotels in the county, and particularly in Santa Rosa, which will drive up tax increment and will drive up TOT. Mm -hmm. All true. Versus 300 housing units, which are actually possible on that site, which is pure tax increment, doesn't have such an effect on, on sales tax, mm -hmm. of course, and has no effect on, on TOT. Those are to what degree the values of those two things can be readily compared is, is hard, you know? So I think, particularly speaking to myself, because I tend to jump towards, you know, rigid quantitative analysis sometimes, a little bit of humility in looking at these things is going to be, I think, important. So before we move forward, I just want to move backward a little bit. Um, the numbers in the couple of slides before this going out to 2070 um talk about money flowing into the to the uh, eift they don't show where the where, where the rest of that money goes to the general funds of both the county and the city can that be produced for us so we can have that information as well yeah typically the fiscal impact analysis looks at the distribution of those two but alan did you have a well no i was just going to say that that's part of the information that we're waiting on and part of the information that helps us give you the what, what our clearest uh, staff recommendation at least on where you have the dollars and what it would take um, if it's a, a if it's a positive return or or negative and so that's a critical piece and we just don't have it yet. We should have it hopefully by the, the end of this month, I, I believe. And then that allows us to do, to finish our analysis internally and to be able to report back. Is it as simple as, um, I always try and go simple when I'm talking about math, um, as extrapolating, if 25% of the county's increment produces this, 75%, goes to the general fund? Um, well, for for this on the city side, yeah, that's probably. I, I'm talking about the county side, but either way. Well, okay. it's all right. Can I, can I clarify the question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so what you're saying is of the increment that would be going to the EIFD, how much of that increment, in, in, increment would have been going to the general funds of the county? And no, what, if this is only 25% of the income. So remainder. Remainder, yeah. got it, got it, okay. So it all would, it, without this district, it would all be going to our general funds. But right now we're talking about, yeah, that remainder part of it would go in. it. And so, yeah, I would, I would, I mean, just in very rough math, that that's, that would be the first place I would look to to, to start doing that analysis. Okay. I mean, it's it's not a ROI study, but it does reflect a return. Um, right. Okay. But the other things that this analysis is going to come in is going to it's going to show the um, uh, uh, 
the service cost to that area. And that is born on the general funds. So, so that's, that's where the, the, uh, 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 that's where we get into a critical part of the analysis because uh, you're, you're, you're pulling money away of what would have paid for the services to come in. So how can we, uh, uh, how is that made up? And, and what is that, uh, uh, where's that balance out? And, and so until we get that information back and can start plugging that in, we're, we're kind of, we're, our hands are a little bit tied on what we can, what, what we can put forward to say, hey, here's, here's how we should go forward. So it, I hate to, to keep kicking the can down the road, but it really is until we get that piece back and we can start formulating most, uh, or DTA can, of really putting the final touches on the IFP and the, the, dis, or the PFA will understand exactly what we're looking at as not only a benefit from the district, but a cost mm -hmm. to the city and county. Okay. Thanks for that, Ellen. Never as simple as I want it to be. <laughs> yeah, it definitely seems like we're being asked to make a, a decision without all the information and that nobody is going to be able to produce all of the information for us. But um, because you asked for some direction, I'll give you, I'll go out on a limb and give you some direction for myself, which is the way I look at this is I'm not an economist, but I am a person who's a, a fan of cities and I go to cities all over the world and I love to walk around them. And I'll tell you what I think brings people to downtowns is, is connectivity and streetscaping. Mm -hmm. And that keeping in mind that any investments we make in those areas is going to be exponentially beneficial to this fund. It's like we're thinking we're getting some funds. It's a static amount one time, but it's like, you know, maybe we've got a windfall from an uncle or, or grandparent. And if we invest it properly, it's going to create more dollars over time. So I'd be in favor of looking at the economic impacts of those things in particular, with the idea of driving people downtown seven days a week, 365 days a year, and not just specifically around special events or conferences. As much as I, I wanna see those things happen as well, I think they're, they are things that are gonna happen with other, other partners and that I'd like to make sure we're, um, we're priming the pump to get economic development going ASA. Remember to yeah, go. so I was sort of going to the same place where I was thinking about categories and, and also sort of, I think, um, I think the affordable housing element, some contribution into affordable housing is important from a social values standpoint and communication of social values, which I think is we need to think about. Um, so I was thinking sort of three categories, placemaking, affordable housing, and then something that I've um, just sort of inelegantly described as um, public-private partnerships with economic development ROI, um, you know, which is on the lines of fairgrounds. I, I believe that we have the ability to do all three of those categories um, with maybe if there's a stronger emphasis percentage-wise in placemaking and less so in affordable housing and in um, the public-private partnership kind of world of these large projects. But I think there's potential there. Um, so those would be the three categories that I would think. And I'm thinking it's like 60, 20, 20, or something along those lines in terms of percentages. Um, just throwing something out. Um, that may be too specific. I don't know. We're not ready to go there. <laughs> you want a direction, so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Anything else before we go to public comment? Uh, Chair, we, um, I apologize. We have a few more slides. Oh. Yeah. Apologies. Mr. Just thinking about, um, and I appreciate your comments. I, I really do. I do think connectivity is mm -hmm. vitally important. And connectivity to me comes in many different ways. And as an architect, and I think there's certain areas downtown that don't have the connectivity they need. Uh, there's blocks where you're just, you walk past the block instead of enjoying that particular block. And a lot of it has to do with some of the strip, high strip windows and less, no interaction between the properties and all those things. Mm -hmm. Bring, you know, I think we have a, a challenge 
think that we should not fool ourselves in the connectivity uh, being a suburban as we are, where are the people really coming from? I look at what Petaluma went through since I've lived there. And part of that is really bringing the people downtown. That's why I was always so supportive of the renewable enterprise district in terms of trying to invest and have those people be part of that, what will be the connectivity. Uh, then hopefully that draws even more. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, connectivity is bigger, broader. And some of that might even be some streets that you want to look at and do some um, modifications to just to, to be able to have that connection mm -hmm. uh, for pedestrians to actually have a positive pedestrian experience on more of the downtown streets than what currently exists. Um, and just a few more slides here in the presentation, um, many things that we've already touched on, uh, but I'll just sort of reiterate. So the potential project list recommendation, which we talked before was try to keep the project categories broad. Um, there can be a priority in the selection criteria in the P. So if we do decide that the three buckets are, are important, um, you can set a percentage, but then also a priority sequence in those three buckets. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, it is possible to restrict spending through the IFP if you are trying to obtain uh, money needed to provide debt services on the bonds. Um, just a really quick clarifying point on the fiscal impact analysis. That is an important piece. We do have draft documents, as the finance team has mentioned. They're reviewing that now. We're going back and forth with DTA. Uh, the requirement for the fiscal impact analysis is embedded in the statute associated with the EIFD. And what you see here is the actual language um, that is the requirement. And this is a companion. It's actually a component of the IFP. And really what it is looking at is that when you define this district and um, to Supervisor Corsi's point, uh, likely if it's 25%, you're pulling 75% back into the general fund, but you're taking 25% out of the general fund. So the fiscal impact analysis looks at the service impacts in that district, and then it looks at the growth projections, it looks at the increase in revenue, and then that's really where it balances it out if it is actually a positive net gain based on what you're proposing to do. So the project lists do become fairly critical to that because you can have more revenue generating projects. Um, EIFDs can provide parks and some of those other facilities that don't necessarily have that. Um, so this document is really what looks at that. Um, as we get that solidified and as our finance team is able to support a recommendation that we can bring forward to council, that will be potentially a member action and we're, we're teeing everything up for that point. Excuse me. So you said like the draft though that was submitted to the supervisors was narrowly positive? Yes. It was narrowly positive. Yes. By what percentage? I don't recall off the top of my head. We can bring that back to the, the yes. curious. I, I would, I would really pause at this point. Prior to giving guidance on whether so it's positive or not, because you know we have had okay. some minor movements, and in really big studies, minor movements matter. Okay, so yeah, I, and I think with the document with the county too, I, the placeholder was fifty percent in that document, and mm -hmm. the contribution from the county moved to twenty five percent, which would lessen that burden. So we are finalizing those documents as well. They will be produced to the county as part of the review process before it goes forward. Um, I think a document of this nature, and it's to Scott's point, very difficult to figure out the long-term impacts. It's really a best guess based on the information that's known at that point in time, whether it would be a positive net impact at 27. Uh, so the next uh, slide really just shows our timeline. Um, so we actually do have feedback from the Board of Supervisors. As I mentioned, we're looking at a council action in November of this year. Um, really what that's teeing up for is introduction of the draft infrastructure financing plan. Um, it may be a bit aggressive to say that that can be December of 2024, but that is the goal that we are shooting for. Um, if it pushes into January, we likely can still hold the timeline that's below it. Um, but generally, what we are trying to achieve here is to set this as the base year. So that means that we're getting this in front of the Board of Supervisors, we're getting it in front of the City Council, the PFA for adoption, we're running through all the public hearings that we have talked about. And generally, if we can get the IFP out, which is really 10 days prior to the meeting date where we introduce it, um, in the early January, December, uh, we can hold that timeline, I'm fairly confident. Um, obviously, it's going to take a coordinated effort with our partners at the county to make sure that the, the um, Board of Supervisors piece happens, uh, but there's, there's a little bit of padding in here to make that happen. 
Um, if we push too far for whatever reason, the worst case scenario is we miss this as the base year, it can push into next year. Um, really the step of going in front of the board of utilization for the actual map boundary happens at the end of the year anyway. Uh, just the PFA has to adopt the IFP by a certain time frame, and that sets the base tax year. So that's really the driver. Um, but we're still trying to hold the line of getting getting everything done this year. And are the expectations of ROI included in the initial draft IFP? So as far as the ROI on projects go, um, no. So as we form the project list, that's an exercise that actually would occur outside of that because you're making more of a project-based determination of the ROI. Um, really what DTA is tasked with doing is developing general revenue increase projections, <clears throat> excuse me, based on development trends. Um, and that's where sometimes that gets to be a more conservative number, but obviously they factor in our downtown station area plan. They factor in a lot of the development and the incentives that city has put in place to make that happen. Um, the, obviously the lack of a crystal ball, they, they don't know when that's going to occur. Um, so it's really in the fiscal impact analysis and the IFP sets that forward, but not the specific project ROI. Okay. And board member Gonzalez, to speak to your earlier question around um, if we're not able to get a tax commitment from our legislative body in November, um, Gabe spoke to the cushion that we, we built in there are going to be two additional city council meetings after the November one that we're targeting, um, which both fall before when this body should meet again in December, which I believe is December 19th. Thank you. And that concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any additional questions the board. Appreciate it. Do you have any more questions? You did a thorough job on questions. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, let's go to public comment. Yes. Um, I think I know all of you, but I'm Caden Single Allenson with the Downtown Action Organization. Um, our organization had an ad hoc committee a couple years ago, actually, and took a look at um, potential projects to include on the IFP. Our board uh, reviewed those again and um, very much in line with what you just shared, Chair Fleming, to really echo that and support uh, selecting the broad categories that allow for projects that really spur economic development, um, specifically focusing on the reconstruction of the streetscape by improving or adding critical infrastructure in the existing right of way. So um, again, we appreciate the um, conversation around keeping it broad and flexible and encourage highly physical, highly impact highly impactful projects within the key corridors, especially Comstock and connectivity with Railroad Square. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have anybody online? Um, are we taking? No, we haven't got what's going on. So. All right, let's go. Our board member, I just think. All right, I'm assuming member Rogers. Uh, hey, can, can the, I'm sorry, can the minutes show that although I'm a board member of the DAO, I abstained when that item came before the DAO? Thank you. All right, we'll close public comment and we'll return to the board for any closing comments. We have a meeting between now and December. Or is that our next one? We can meet as needed. We can and will meet as needed. I'm not suggesting that we meet if not needed. No, and we will not meet if we don't need to. <laughs> so December is the next schedule. December is the next meeting that we have to have. We have to have a meeting to go forward. I'll turn that, let's let Gabe answer that question. So we're on a monthly frequency as a, a placeholder. Uh, so what we can do as it currently stands now, our next big critical piece is, is our meeting with the city council. Um, for October, if there is a desire of the board to meet, what we can do based on the feedback we received, we can work the, the categories, the broad categories, percentage concepts to help evolve that conversation a bit. Um, that might benefit us a bit by providing a little more guidance of what the board's direction is to the council as we move forward, because we're able to bake it a little more. I am sensitive to the fact that everyone is busy these days, um, but that is a possible agenda item for the October meeting, which would then lead up very well to the November meeting because it would meet that timeline to where we can still bake that into the council presentation. Remind us what day that, do we have a set date for the council to hear this item? 
Uh, we're trying to get it on the November 19th okay. uh, council agenda. Okay. Got it. That'd be up to. Uh, so I'm happy to convene a meeting in October if that's the will of this body. It's not agendized for this item, but um, I will, you know, be responsive to your, your wishes. And I'd be happy to leave it up to you and staff to decide whether it's needed or helpful. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? All right, next item. Five point one discussion of next meeting agenda. <laughs> <laughs> we have a really eager board. <laughs> Do we have anything else on this topic? With that, item six of this meeting, uh, which is adjournment, this meeting of the Public Financing Authority is now adjourned. Thank you all for your help. Thank you. Thank you.